I'm so glad to be here today at WordCamp. Um, so far, I've met amazing people, and I just love the whole vibe of this. So thank you. Um, yeah, so today I'm giving a presentation on building a generous business. And I got to practice actually telling people what my talk was going to be about at the speaker dinner yesterday. And I realized that the best way to introduce this topic is when someone says, what are you talking about? I can say, boundaries. Because building a generous business is maybe the motivation, but in a lot of ways, what we need to talk about when we talk about generosity is boundaries. So I'm going to start just by quick show of hands so I can get to know everybody here who works with clients. OK, good. I was really worried. Like, when I was talking to people around you know, in the lobby and at the speaker event, I was like, anybody here work with clients? <laughs> or are folks like, working for companies or have a, a different arrangement? So that's great. I'm at the right, the right place, talking to the right people. So all right, raise your hand again if you've ever had this client. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so yeah, so my, my story, the sort of uh, boss situation that I ran into, um, had quite a few. But I actually did a bunch of pro bono work. Um, I love doing pro bono work. I love doing side projects. It's actually a big part of how I get referrals and how I have built a portfolio is by seeking out projects that I care about that I want to support. And so I did a community center uh, website design and build. I think I might have a slide about that somewhere. Yeah, there it is. So it was like 30 plus pages, multiple projects, multiple project leaders, um, conditional posts based on what project, an events calendar, a community events submission form, all the stuff that WordPress is really good for, right? So you wouldn't want to build this on a Weebly platform or something like that. And what happened was that the client didn't value the site. So has anybody ever given something away for free and then it wasn't valued? Yeah, so that's what happened. And so, you know, I launched the site. I reach out to them. I say, OK, we need to talk about hosting. We need to talk about maintenance. No response. In fact, I had no response for months. And then finally, I get a response. And it's all caps. And it's like, we need to post this right now. How do we do it? <laughs> so of course, I post it for them. <laughs> and I say, well, how about the, the, you know, the maintenance and everything? And no response. So what do I do? I keep paying for it. So yeah, so boundaries, right? Uh, so this has become one of my favorite problems. And this article about Richard Feynman uh, from Tiago Forte is excellent. It goes into this idea of having 12 favorite problems that you kind of hold on to. And Feynman is this you know, incredible physicist who figured out all these great things. And what he said was, you've got to hold these problems in, in your mind. And throughout time, sometimes uh, just through the various inputs of what you experience and what you see, something clicks. And you start to make sense of it. So th these are some of my favorite business problems, which is how to build a generous business, how to raise prices and value while still being generous, while still feeling aligned, while doing work with clients I love working with. Also, how to scale a service without losing quality and without losing hospitality. So when trying to solve a problem, I try to figure out, well, what do we want? So as designers, as developers or business owners, we want to be fair. You know, we want to feel like we're within integrity. We want to be respected. We want to be helpful. We want to sell without being icky, without using, uh, you know, hype or fake deadlines and things like that. We want to provide genuine value. Ultimately, I think a lot of us who work with clients do this work because we want to be generous. 
So we need boundaries. We need time boundaries. We need scope boundaries. We need communication boundaries. We need process boundaries, value boundaries, money boundaries, focus boundaries. And that's what I'm going to be exploring a bit as we get through this presentation, which actually I have this nice progress bar here you can follow along with. So David Allen, who wrote Getting Things Done and has been kind of my origin story into doing knowledge work and design work, um, talks about mind like water. And he borrows that concept from martial arts, which I'm sure it's connected to all sorts of other disciplines because it's a pretty awesome concept. So I'm going to go with it too. The idea of mind like water is that we want to react appropriately to things. So we don't want to underreact to the tax bill and not pay it and then get in a whole heap of trouble. We don't want to overreact to it and, you know, get really stressed out about something that we can, you know, hopefully control and deal with. Uh, I think it's the same with clients. We don't want to underreact to their communication style, you know, the ways that they like might push our buttons. We don't want to overreact or underreact. So process is how we get there. Process equals boundaries. Boundaries makes us generous. Generosity equals growth. So I have a, a really cool contrasting experience that I recently had about maybe a month or so ago, um, which my friends here in the center know all about because I had to vent about this client situation with them a lot. <laughs> um, I had a contrasting experience. I had two clients, same service. I was offering a retainer service, marketing consultation, content editing, publishing, stuff like that. I was getting text messages at night, like 10 o'clock at night, getting emails in all caps, just normal emails too, not even like no need for all caps. <laughs> Come on. Um, one of my clients called uh, one of my other clients to complain th with them about my pricing uh, and also called one of my contractors and tried to ask them to work with her directly instead of with me, which is kind of weird. Yeah. Um, ultimately, the, these clients were both really stressed out. They were really stressed out because they were launching their online programs, and that's a really stressful roller coaster experience. And the contrasting experience was so freeing for me because what happened was I held a boundary with them. I don't know if my slide, yeah, my next slide doesn't say anything about this. So <laughs> I held my boundary, and one client had like a total tantrum, and the other client was like, thank you. Now I know like what I need to do and started working within my process. And it was so amazing because I hadn't had that type of contrasting experience before. So not having a process, like, and, and what I mean by boundaries, as I said, all right, here's the updates. Here's what I've done so far. Here's what's coming up next. Here's, what, here's when I'm available. So I basically just reasserted some of my process. So without, without a process, these are the types of things that I tend to feel. I feel guilty. I start to talk down my pricing and my values. I have doubt. I start wondering if I couldn't uh, do this like huge project in as tiny of a scope as possible. Am I even good at it? Like, do I even know what I'm doing? So I start doubting myself. When I have anxiety, when I get these all caps emails, I start to procrastinate or under communicate because I, I resent the client. So I start kind of participating in this dance of not necessarily being the most responsible either. And that kind of sets me up to feel worried about setting a boundary because now I'm showing up saying, well, I haven't been communicating. I haven't really been, uh, you know, upholding my end of the, of the structure. So now I'm going to create structure. So, yeah, without a process, I just started to get a bit adrift. And, um, of course, with perfectionism, trying to really over-deliver tends to lead to scope creep. So now I'm doing a lot more than I necessarily need to do or that's included. So 
Then you have this, this other client who, the moment that I put that process in place, immediately I start feeling more generous. I start feeling like I can communicate more clearly. I feel like I understand the value that I'm bringing. Um, I'm able to feel more confident because I have a process to get a repeatable outcome for them. Um, I'm just generally more calm. I'm more calm when I'm talking to potential clients doing sales. Um, I'm more calm when I'm closing a project and I'm saying, you know, it's done. Um, and also just being able to finish things on time. So this whole experience of, of designing processes and, um, you know, figuring out boundaries was really the moment that my business started to grow. So this, this is my transition slide that tells me that we're going into the next part of the talk. Um, so, what I'm going to do is go through those different things that I mentioned before, like time, process, audience, offers, pricing, and I'm going to open each one with a question, and then I'm going to show you a few of the ways that I've answered that question. It kind of goes back to that 12 interesting problems concept. So, who has an expensive problem I can solve today? That's a really helpful question to ask when figuring out what services and what process will work best. So I'm just going to give a couple examples. For web designers, it's going to be anyone who has traffic without a clear offer. So I have about 100 clients on a care plan, and I can see their analytics. So I got an analytics report. And I looked at the report, and I, and I thought, wow, Commonwealth Herbs, they've gone up almost 1,000 views. They're, they're averaging it for around uh, you know, 25,000 views uh, a month right now. Maybe they want to talk to me about conversion rate optimization, right? So a monthly retainer where I could be meeting with them once a month. I could be reviewing their copy, and I could be giving them um, suggestions of what they could do. So for designers, it's a really good, good to focus on conversion rate optimization. For developers, it might be a monthly retainer, reducing risk, improving the experience, increasing sales. So someone who relies on their website for money is going to feel generous paying your rights to reduce the risk of their store going down because they're making money off of their website. For entrepreneurs who are you know, wanting to create a, a repeatable solution, uh, a care plan service, something that can be a very clear fixed scope that could scale, something like uptime monitoring, support desk updates. The care plan service that I created was the first time that I went from feast and famine cycles into recurring revenue. And just that safety of the recurring revenue meant that I could start being more selective about who my clients were. It's amazing. All right, now I want to talk about offers. So oftentimes when, when I first was getting started, I was offering what other web designers were offering. And so I think the interesting question here is, what do your leads and clients or, or target audience really need? Like, What do they actually need? And what they need is for you to take charge. They need to learn your value. They need to understand you know, why, uh, you know, why you do it the way that you do it, why you charge what you charge. They need to be provided an appropriate offer at the appropriate time. And they need guidance. So here's a little example. This is Sebastian at a restaurant called Mixeo. This was my favorite place to go and get breakfast and lunch um, in Ithaca, where I'm from, Ithaca, New York. And Sebastian was really um, an incredible chef. He had a lot of integrity. 
a lot of commitment to what he did. So he stopped letting people tell him what was going to go in the burritos. <laughs> he just completely took his order form off the table. He was like, no, we're not doing that anymore because people don't know how to combine things in the burrito and then they complain about it. I thought that was amazing. I was like, yes, <laughs> but could you just add a little bit? No. Because <laughs> what happened was people would put a lot of cold ingredients and then they would basically get like a wet salad that was like falling out of a tortilla. So he was just like, no, I'm done with that. Um, <laughs> so yeah, clients need you to tell them what is included and why. You can't let them customize it unless they have, you know, unless they really know what they're doing. They also need to learn more about your value. And one of the best ways to do this is to use a framework. So what I'm showing you here on the left is a spider graph from mysnapshot.co. Um, this is a self-assessment tool that I give to clients that has them basically rate themselves and rate their website on 16 different points. So outline, copy, media, outreach, funnels, software, hosting, publishing, style, graphics, layout, email list, stuff like that. And what this does, what's so magical about this, is that the time that they take to fill this out reveals to them, it reveals to them all of their known unknowns. So they start realizing like what they don't know yet. And the best part about this type of assessment, which is based on a rubric, is that they, when they're answering the questions, they're actually reading a description about what it means to be basic, developing, capable, and exceptional in each of these areas. So they start to understand what it means to have an exceptional website. And when they understand the known unknowns, they start getting really curious about the services that I'm offering. I also use templates and Miro boards. This um, diagram on the right is something I created in Miro, which is basically an online whiteboard tool. Anybody here use Miro? Awesome, yeah, it's, it's so cool. You can zoom in, you can zoom out, you can add sticky notes. You can do so much stuff with this. But this really impresses clients because I get on a Zoom call, I share my screen, and I say, here's the process. First, this is actually part two of my process. So this is the design and content phase. So I'm like, here's our process. First, we're gonna, you're going to read this guide. You know, and I sent that to them in advance. And then we're going to talk about the content plan. We're going to talk about who your audience is. We're going to talk about what they're looking to answer. And I have them outline all of their content based on the questions that their audience needs to answer. So instead of having a blank page, they're actually answering their own questions. And maybe I help them identify some of those questions if they, if they don't know. So using frameworks like this make it really clear what your value is, that you're not just taking orders from them. It also means that you're in control. So they're not thinking they have to micromanage you anymore. Now they're relaxing into that place of, great, you know, they're on it. All right. So I'm missing a word at the top, but I think you can fill in the blanks here. The, the next thing is you need to provide an appropriate offer. And this is a tool that I use with my clients, but I also use it to structure my own business, which is an axis of commitment and awareness. So when somebody is not very aware of the topic or the solution or the problem and you know, all that kind of stuff, then they're going to have like a lower commitment offer is going to be more appropriate for them, right? So this example ladder, which I use, is self-assessment, a 10-minute video, or, or oftentimes I actually have like a series of 10-minute videos. Uh, I do free classes, so I have people register, I do webinars, I do programs, and I do consulting. So the pricing also goes up on that ladder as well. So it's really just about getting the right appropriate offer to them. 
All right. And the final thing is clients need guidance. I talked about this a little bit with the spider graph and everything and just having a framework. But the more guidance that you can give them, you can see the align your offer is right there in the center. But the reason I have this set up is so that even in an initial meeting, they can see, oh, wow, there's a lot more to this. We're, we're just in this like free 15-minute call. Ryan's just like bringing me into this one little pick, you know, section. We're talking about offers. And the reason I'm talking with them about offers is because I want them to understand that their website isn't a brochure. Their website is a place to interact with their potential customers. Through that interaction, they're building trust and awareness and commitment. And once they understand that I'm guiding them in that direction of seeing their website as this bigger picture, they have a, an incredible amount of trust in the process. They have trust that they're going to get a return on investment. OK, now I want to talk about scope. The question here is, how can I easily negotiate scope instead of price? So somebody says, um, that, that price is too high. Then I can say, great, let's talk about the scope. And it changes the conversation away from how much is my value and how much do you want or what do you want? And then that's, again, where you need to get clear on boundaries because remember, just like with the burrito, you can't say, I just want you know, a third of a burrito. I, I mean, actually, that does work if you wanted to only eat a little third of a burrito. But you get it, right? Let's can you just do the burrito, but like without, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm gonna, I'll work on that one. Um, so one of the ways that you can be generous about your scope is by understanding your margins. And you know, I can give a, a shout out to the Business Numbers podcast for basically being my free education on business finances. So thank you to Ben McAdam for, for giving me that education. But margins is really interesting because a lot of people, when they're new at running their business, they basically consider their own labor to be free. And so they don't build in margins into their services. So the idea behind margins is also this like rule of thirds, which I got from my friend's mom, who, who said, like, this is how we budget uh, with the rule of thirds. And so I, I learned about that. And, um, but basically, the idea is that every service that you have should have a 65% gross profit margin, which means that you have about you know, 30 33% to spend on fulfilling the service. So it should cost you, if you sell a website for $6,000, you have $2,000 to spend on building the website. And that's also your own time, right? But when you know what those numbers are, you can feel generous about spending it. You can feel generous about paying the developer who's working with you on it, um, you know, for all the time that it takes to build it. You don't have to be worried you know exactly how much you have to work with. If you also, if you get stressed out and you start feeling like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm like, I'm in the red, um, but you've set your profit margins accordingly, then yeah, you're in the red, but you're, not, you're still not losing money. And the point here is that you need money to invest on operations and growth. So you need money to spend on marketing, you need money to spend on bookkeeping, sending invoices, um, all that kind of stuff distracting yourself, all the things that we do. Um, so we also need to get clear on our offer numbers. So um, the idea here, this is a, an example of a spreadsheet where you calculate the expense of fulfillment. So you can see here in this example, this would be my um, like conversion rate optimization service. So I might go through it and say, OK, this is how much I want to uh, this is my expense for coaching call, for portal updates, for just basic customer service, things like that. And so then if I charge $950, then I'm staying within the correct profit margin for that service. Um, and I could probably even charge more depending on what the, what the situation was. 
So really, like, getting clear on your offer numbers helps you make those choices. All right. And then also revenue streams. So like I said before, I started a care plan service. That care plan service gave me stability. So I wouldn't be in a feast and famine cycle with website projects. So if I look at revenue in my business, I have custom projects, retainers, um, I call it Sapling Website Service. It's this um, website accelerator group program that I run. And I have care plans and then affiliate revenue. This is not how much money I'm making, by the way. <laughs> this is like, I'm going to talk later about the goal, the goal numbers and having generous goals. Yeah, so we'll get to that. <laughs> but the idea is that when you create a picture and you understand your revenue and the different streams of revenue, you can kind of ask some more interesting questions, like maybe custom projects aren't, maybe I don't actually need custom projects that much. Maybe that's not actually a big percentage of my revenue. Maybe custom projects are more of a like portfolio building, like referral engine opportunity. And so I wanna be really selective about who I'm working with because my real money is coming from retainers. And if my real money is coming from retainers, well, how many retainers do I need? And in this picture, if I want to make $15,000 of monthly recurring revenue, then I only need 10 to 15 retainers at 1,000 to 1,500 a month. So, wow, if I did conversion rate optimization for people who had a, a, an expensive problem that I can solve easily, and I was able to charge $1,000 a month and have 15 websites a month that I was doing a conversion rate optimization like review for as a designer, like, wow, <laughs> that's pretty cool. So this is conceptual, but this is the point is to, you know, looking at your revenue streams, you can figure out ways to change your business model to be more generous. So I have custom projects. One of the ways that I manage those is, let me just go back to the top here. Yeah, with the scope. One of the ways that I manage scope for custom projects is I um, give a getting started guide. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in one of the next slides. All right. I want to talk about process. Process includes onboarding. It includes portals. It includes regular communication touch points, milestones, things like that. So the question that I think the interesting question to hold for this is how do you provide an experience that empowers clients? So when you're empowering, like in that contrasting example that I shared before, having like reinforcing that boundary and process actually empowered this client. So onboarding is key. So again, the getting started guide, kickoff call. I have an onboarding checklist for each client. And this screenshot just shows that in the guide, I'm, I have an entire section that's like your crucial role. Like these are the things that only you can do. And that's my way of saying, let me do the things that I can do. This is your role. I provide a client portal where I can give project updates. I can organize all of the client assets into these tidy little toggle lists. And then you can't really see too much of the bottom, but I can also go through my deliverables in order of the phase. So if I'm building a website project, I've got onboarding, kickoff call, welcome packet, discovery, design drafts, design iterations, development where I'm building layouts, all the way to launch. And so I have it all mapped out in a client portal. Each of those items can open up into a page that can teach my client but it also is there so that if I bring on new team members, I can say, here's our notes. Help us, help us evolve this. Help us iterate it. Regular touch points, and this is actually the video I sent to um, one client who apparently didn't watch it. Um, <laughs> but it's nice. You get, to, you get to know, right? You can send a reminder email if you need to. But uh, a touch point is an opportunity for you to be consistent with your communication and say, this is what I did, this is what's coming up. And what I do is I actually record myself updating their portal. So while I'm updating their portal, I'm recording it. So that's my own like built-in accountability for myself. 
And another thing that really helps is to send emails at the appropriate time. So send it when, when they're going to be able to respond. So they're more likely to procrastinate if they get an email in the afternoon. They're more likely to respond to me if they get an email in the morning. So if I do my updates on Thursdays, schedule it to go out Friday morning, end of the week, falls in their court. I think also it's really important to assume, or not to assume, that clients know how to work with you. So um, I have a like how to give feedback to designers um, guide that's included in the onboarding. So like teach them, teach them how to give feedback. One of those things is like ask them to. I always say like assume that I have a reason behind every, everything that I'm doing. You know I'm not just. Uh, designing it in a certain way because of my opinion. Assume that there's a reason. So ask, ask questions as much as possible. But I always frame it in their benefit. So like, I'm going to be able to deliver this faster for you. We can arrive at better solutions. Um, you can really leverage our time. So speaking of time, that's the next one. How can you make faster decisions and protect your energy? So this is, I think this image is a joke, but of peak productivity. Because when I looked at it, I was like, cool, an image about pre productivity, but I think it's a joke. Um, but I think it also like, emphasizes that in this scenario where 2 AM is the only time you don't have distractions and you're not, well, I would be too tired, but there's like, a lack of boundaries. So the question is, when are you at your best? I'm sure you've heard of this concept. But just like, you know, when, do you, when is the, those like, golden three hours that you can actually get things done? And the way that helps me as I theme my days. So if I structure my days to have themes, then I know exactly when I'm available for clients and when I'm not. So I stopped doing meetings in the mornings, except for Tuesdays. And um, now that I don't have meetings in the mornings, I just know that that time is protected. But it also makes it easy for me to schedule calls. So I optimize my booking calendar to only be available on certain days. So yeah, sometimes clients have to wait another week, because I only do meetings on Tuesdays and Fridays. But it allows me to feel calm through the rest of the week, but still be available for them. Another thing is I started doing recreation meetings. So I started, like, some meetings, I'll just take the dog on a walk, or I'll be, like, doing chores. So if I don't need to be in front of the computer taking notes, then don't do it. Like, normalizing audio-only Zoom calls is really, really helpful for my health. <laughs> OK, so this is the goals part. Um, has anybody seen the new like, Netflix show about being rich? Ramit Sethi? Yeah, a couple people. So it, it's, it's actually like a really down-to-earth, like, genuine show. Like, in, like, I really liked it. It was really interesting. And what I liked about it was it starts with the premise of like, defining your rich life. And the question, I think, is not about like how much money do you want to make, but how do you want to feel? And what does that mean for you? So for me, I lived in an off-grid cabin for four years. Um, I you know, had to haul water, all that kind of stuff. But that was one of the most like, richest experiences that I have ever had. So how do you want to feel, and what kind of ways can you structure your life to support that. And that's what the goal picture that I brought up before is about. So setting a goal, coming up with like what a sort of example monthly re recurring revenue might look like. I run an agency, so there's four of us on the team. And my main goal is to build a team that feels really supportive and that feels really fun. And I really want everybody to stick around, and I want them to have job security and see a future working together as a group. So that's why I'm setting my goal higher and then breaking that down. So knowing what the expense budget is, and then the reason why that's so helpful is that it gets me to stretch. I couldn't do something at a website internet thing without a cat picture, so I found a way to squeeze it in. <laughs> um, the reason that like this big goal, which I was really uncomfortable with at the time, uh, being like, I want a, a million dollars a year. I was like, I'll just put that out there because that just feels totally unattainable and ridiculous. 
But what happened was it got me to really think about my limiting beliefs, and it also got me to think about how my service would change. So if I was doing a million dollars a year in revenue, I could never do that with custom projects that had a start and an end time. It just wouldn't be possible. There's no way to do that unless I continue to scale my team over and over and over, you know, multiple levels of, of management. And maybe that's a limiting belief. I would love to talk to somebody who could help me pitch some really big number one-time projects. So, yeah, I, I think that, like, having a big goal is really important for, for having that kind of a stretch. So generous environment. What kind of environment supports you to be most generous? Well, good people, of course. So <laughs> this is like you just want to be supported in being yourself. And if you can be yourself with clients, in fact, I think this is the promise of like having a service-based business, especially on the Internet, is that you can build a niche just around your own like weirdness. And people who like you, who accept you, will hire you. And it's like this crazy, amazing thing where you don't have to pretend to be somebody you're not. It's incredible. So, yeah, like finding people who really like see your potential, also like friends who challenge you to do great work, all that kind of stuff. And then, of course, like setting up a cool space that you feel inspired by. So I got really geeky about my desk, took a picture of it, took like a thousand pictures of it, actually. Um, <laughs> there's this website called Grove Made that's just like, just like incredible pictures of desks, and they sell you like little trinkets that cost a lot of money. It's called Grove Made. Oh my gosh, I love it. Just look at that all day. And then also like finding an environment where like you're in a cohort of peers that are working on similar things. So, you know, shout out to the web pro group right here in the middle. Uh, these are the folks, these folks got me to come to this conference. They were like, let's, let's all go to WordCamp and see, like, you know. So like people who really get it, people who support you to, to do what you got to do. Also, Lasha, my instant best friend who I met at Craft and Commerce. Yeah. Good people to know. And so, like, when you go to conferences, you can meet amazing people. So, like, that's something we should do here at WordCamp, right? should, like, spend some time meeting people, staying in touch with them. That's going to create the kind of environment that we need. So, I'm going to go through operations. The question here is what systems allow you to be generous, to build a team around your vision. So we have a, a team dashboard that has like one central hub for all of our information, a team handbook. But the kind of top level documents that structure the business are the, our objectives, our decision making guidelines, our core values, things, you know, how we do project management, stuff like that. Having roles that's structured around those different areas so fulfillment, which is actually finishing the projects, operations, running the business, and growth, attracting new people. So in this diagram, the purple is me. So I created the diagram even though I was doing mostly everything. And that allowed me to start showing the team and say, hey, this is your path into other things. Like, that's, like I'm mapping it out so that we can get there. Um, of course, the process for your clients, that's part of your operations as well, and it also helps your team. And then it's really important to have a process for organizing knowledge. So we have a shared documentation database. We track changes, versions, and creators automatically. So it's all built in. You know who created something, who updated it. And in all of our documentation, we just use a really simple what, why, how template. So it's really easy to write our procedures. The last piece of this framework is generous growth. So how do you cultivate growth with as little effort as possible? And it really comes down to this concept that Nathan Berry from ConvertKit um, explained at his main stage talk a few weeks ago, which is the flywheel. So rather than the consistent effort, you only get an outcome if you put in effort, create some kind of cycle. So one of those flywheels that you can use for your business is a testimonial flywheel. So the idea is you take that, um, you build in with automation requests for testimonials, which then you can put on your sales page, which generates more sales, so on and so forth. 
And so especially when you have a clear process like this and you're coaching your clients and you're, you're explaining to them how to be good clients, how the process works, all the stuff that you do, it's much easier to ask for testimonials because they're pretty consistently amazed um, at the experience. They're, they're kind of shocked by it. And one of the ways you can get testimonials is you ask people this question, what surprised you the most? And just that, that word surprise is, is incredible when you're asking for testimonials. It gets right to the, right to the stuff that you need. So what's the, the big picture as we wrap up? We just have about five minutes left. What's the big picture? And actually, uh, on the airplane back from Craft and Commerce, I watched a TED Talk <laughs> from Simon Sinek, which... The title of this talk is How Great Leaders Inspire Action. And he explained the why, how, and what circles. And of course, I'm, I'm obsessed with circles because maple is the name of my business. And I use the tree rings as a logo and as a metaphor for iteration. And what I realized when I was watching that video is that this idea is the why, how, and the what. So everything that we just talked about today was just kind of scratching the surface on the how. The what is the service that you're providing, and the why is what's the impact that you want to make in the world. And so one of the ways to get to the why is to choose a target audience that inspires you, because design is leverage. Design is all about finding those like opportunities to make a really big change with the right kind of input or solutions. But the how isn't just how you build it for them. It's all the stuff that you do to create an experience. It's like the experience at a restaurant. It's, it's why, uh, you know, uh, the DMV... <laughs> or, or like, it's why the restaurant doesn't look like the DMV, right? <laughs> yeah, the DMV needs to work a little bit on their process. So these are the things that we covered, basically. So we're talking about the why. If your goal is to be generous and make a difference, then the how is your process. And that's how you're going to protect it. It's how you're going to empower clients. It increases your value. It makes you unique. You stand out from other people in the industry. It establishes your expertise because you're teaching them the framework. You're teaching them the known unknowns. You're helping them understand what you do without getting into all the details. It empowers them to understand what their role in the project is and what your role is. It supports your boundaries so you don't get texts in the middle of the night or all caps emails or all that kind of stuff. And it allows you to be generous. So this is my closing question. I want you to get out your phones. <laughs> and text me. <laughs> and all of you on the internets and the live stream, now you have my phone number, so you can text me too. <laughs> yeah, at 10 p.m. Yeah, go for it. All caps. <laughs> Because I really want you to, to walk out of this talk with an action item. I want you to, to answer this question. Just what's one thing you can do this week? Well, let's just pretend it's like the beginning of the week. So what are you going to do this week? I'll give you a little bit more time uh, to improve your process. So you all work with clients. And there's something that you need to work on that this prompted. Some ideas, onboarding, themed days, understand the cost of fulfilling your service, drawing your, your business framework. And the reason I asked you to text me is because I'm going to read off a couple of them. I forgot to tell you that at the beginning. I'm waiting to see if it works. All right, I'm going to read them off in just a minute. <laughs> so
So as I wait for these all caps urgent texts to come in, <laughs> I just want to I just want to say thanks to WordPress WordCamp. I mean, because hosting an event like this is an act of generosity. It's everyone who worked on the lighting and connected the microphones and who's running the live stream and who's like cleaning the space and just maintaining it for us, opening the doors in the morning, um, sending out emails. There's so much that goes into hosting an event like this, and it's really cool. I'm really glad that I'm here. It's my first time. I'll definitely come back again, so thanks. And I'd also love to stay in touch. I put the slides up for you if you want to get the slides. Inside the slides, I'm adding links. I'll be using this slideshow again, so I'll keep developing on it as I work on this framework. This is fairly, you know, this is, yeah. All right, I got, it. I got one text. It says, I will create a, pro I'm, gonna, I'm gonna like tone down the yelling here, I'll just say it. <laughs> I'll create a process diagram to show clients the process and explain their role in the project and mine. Awesome. And I'm, my uh, my text thing isn't isn't like coming in, so I want to invite some folks to just talk to me about this. I'm glad that you sent it. I'll be able to see them later, so I'll be able to respond to you and check in with you about how it how it goes. So, with that, thank you. Y'all are awesome. Oh man, it was awesome. So um, I actually, that's how I started my, my web design business is I was living in a cabin on a river in um, Van Etten, New York. And I was, my neighbors ran a cidery called Eve's Cidery, this amazing cidery. And I actually used to work for them. So I, I worked in the food service and farm industry for 10 years. And I knew a bit about websites because I had, played around with them and built them and, and done some like, you know, volunteer website work um, for a while. And uh, yeah, they were just struggling with their website. They were relying on distributors and things like that for their, for their cider product. And so I helped them rebuild a website and I was like going back and forth to their barn to charge up my computer. And basically <laughs> like the boundary that I had around my work, of, like not working too much was my computer would die and I'd have to go charge it. So I'd like jump on the trampoline with their like little kids while I waited for my computer to charge. So yeah, it was great. And I saved a lot of money when I was there, too, because living off-grid is cheap. No subscription services, nothing. <laughs> Lasha. So being at the Craft and Commerce conference, uh, being introduced to the concept of using flywheels uh, to create a process, um, or maybe using uh, process and flywheels uh, in conjunction. How do you how do you go about building mental models to like always think in that sense when you're trying to create a productive system? Yeah, that's a great question. So the idea of a flywheel is that like every step of the flywheel is like kind of feeding or propelling the next step forward, and Actually, one of the slides didn't um, didn't pop up. I think there it is. Flywheel versus funnel. This is really cool. So look at how urgent the funnel looks. It's actually an exclamation point. <laughs> and so, like, that's why the whole like one-off projects, or or in this case, I I do copyright. I help. Well, okay. So my niche is I work with educators who do online programs, and I work with like cohort-based courses. So I've been done a lot of funnels and a lot of launch projects, and it's incredibly stressful. This is why the, you get Bowser coming in at 10 o'clock at night with all caps, because they're stressed out. And so I want my clients to also become more customer-centric, because they can slow down a little bit and, and be more structured into this model. But if you think from a, from a, in a flywheel, it really puts customers at the center. And that's what's so cool about it. I mean, it's, it is definitely a way of thinking, 
but you can take a lot of linear processes and you can bend them into a circle by just including things like follow-up 30 days later or some kind of coaching. So you deliver a product to somebody, you deliver a website, and then you say, all right, let's, let's, have a, let's talk about care plans. Let's talk about when we're going to check in and, and keep working together because they're going to need support. And if you give them support, then their systems turn and your systems turn. Hi, um, quick question for you. What was the name of the tool that you referenced uh, when you showed the spider graph? Something.co. Yeah, yeah, that is something um, part. That is my snapshot. Uh, that's what it was. Thank my you. snapshot.co. And that is um, Charlotte Crowder who, who created that. She's a really incredible um, person to, to pay attention to in the education space. Um, yeah, she has a, an excellent newsletter. Uh, regarding the things you uh, told, expectation and the margin, right? Uh, many times it happens like client is expecting some more, whatever is defined in the scope. But uh, when the client is not technical, they are like, that is what we are looking. And then we have to change the whole scope. But they are not changing the uh, budget, what they have assigned to us. Mm, yeah. So how to tackle in such a situation? <laughs> yeah, so in, in situations like that, where the client doesn't totally, un it seems like they don't totally understand like how to get what they want. So they're expecting something, and then maybe partway through the project, they're, they're wanting to change the scope, or it makes you feel like you have to change the scope to try to meet their expectation. Yeah, that, yeah, that can happen a lot. So the... <laughs> What I think really helps with that is, I don't think I have a slide for this, but um, I do. I started doing road mapping projects. And has anybody here done road mapping projects? Or basically, yeah, awesome. So like, what I did is I basically took like the discovery part of the website process, which I usually do discovery, design, development, and deliver. and I took the discovery part and I started selling that separately as a consulting package. And what's amazing about road mapping is that not only am I like protecting myself from that situation because I'm actually planning the whole thing, is I'm also uh, competing with other agencies. So I had a meeting the other day where I was like, okay, so let's talk about budget. And I said, what are some of the other agencies you know, what are the figures that, they're, that you're talking about with them? <laughs> and then they said, oh, yeah, I'm talking to this one agency, blah, 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 that, you know, 40000 or something. And I'm, I'm like, oh, <laughs> I work with, like, small farms and stuff, and so we're talking, you know, smaller projects here. So I, I, I'm like, oh, well, that sounds reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, uh, but I, but, you know, one thing that I think you should know is that oftentimes agencies don't put a lot of planning into projects before they give you the proposal. Um, so the way that I do it is I actually have a road mapping project, and that's $1,500. And we're going to go through the whole process of figuring out how to get where you want to go and what are all the ways you could get there, what are the priorities right now. and maybe that $40,000 budget isn't just like for this project and then there's all these unknown expenses later. Maybe we figure out a way to make that stretch out over a 12-month retainer. And now I'm like, now they've, I've got their attention because I still have them thinking about this larger budget, which is helpful for thinking about a more long-term engagement. So yeah, road mapping, definitely. I, I definitely want to do like proper research and education with them. Yeah. Great talk. I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed your um, an, um, analysis of starting a business and running it. Could you talk a little bit more about the um, uh, profitability percentages that you, you had a whole slide on it, and I thought that was really good. That's my biggest weakness. Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I want to admit that, like, the reason that I'm 
focused so much on this is because I struggle so much with boundaries. And it's been a, a way for me to like figure out my way in the world is to like design systems. So it might even be just a boundary with myself and like my own ability to like manage my time effectively or manage my distractions or priorities. So systems are, are everything for me. And with pricing, um, I have also struggled with underpricing or undervaluing my work. And then I see what someone else is charging and I'm like, oh my goodness, like it's, it's incredible. So this idea of like profit margin is really key. Um, I use a software called Harpoon to manage all my um, invoicing and stuff like that. And what, what I like about Harpoon is that um, it asks you to set a goal for yourself and then it breaks down that goal every month and tells you kind of how you're doing on that goal throughout like any given time. But it also helps you set a budget for how much you, how much you want to work on something and you can track your time inside this software as well. So it'll be like, you're in the red, Ryan. Like, you're doing real bad right now when I'm still making a profit. So it's really helpful to have, like, a system that reinforces the, the idea of, like, a gross profit margin of, like, around 65 or something percent. And that, that is, just means, like, however much it costs you to, to do it, um, if you were to give yourself an hourly rate and estimate that you're spending, you know, X number of hours on a website, however much it costs for you to pay yourself, you still have to add on to that the other 60% or 63 or whatever percent. Yeah. 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 So if I wanted to charge, if if my hourly, if I was gonna, if I wanted to pay myself fifty dollars an hour, then my hourly rate needs to be one hundred and fifty dollars an hour, so that when I'm on board, when I'm doing non-billable work, which is onboarding, marketing, sending invoices, stuff like that, I can still pay myself that fifty dollars an hour for the non-billable work. And then when I'm doing the billable work, I'm billing at one hundred and fifty dollars an hour, so that I can cover those those things. Thank you so much, everybody. I, I actually really enjoyed the questions. So, yeah.